you. Yes, sir. Eight hundred. You, me. Here. 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 Oh. Get that <laughs> <laughs> She's here. Yeah, sorry, here. <laughs> They're nice. But I already had all those meetings. Well, I didn't have Jim Right. May I? Okay. May I suggest we do the business first? Yes. Um, so I think because some people are going to have to leave a little early tonight, could we do all the action items? At the beginning. Thank you. Good evening. Joe DeSanti with Downs Correct uh, Construction, Director of Construction Management. Uh, we have a couple of people that are out ill actually uh, from Gilbane, so they won't be here, but I'll give an update later on. They just sent me some information. And the Pell update, um, we have two Downs members that are stuck on the other side of town and they're going to be coming late. So we're going to do the first couple of action items first. Um, we'll do the, we'll do all of them. All of them. Okay. Yeah. So the first action item is bid package number four for roofing. And we'll have Slam or Ted, one of you guys can come up here and just give a brief overview of what that bid package looks like. Okay. Good evening, Kathy Ellithorpe from SLAM. Um, I forgot to bring the cover sheet with me like I usually do of the bid package, but we have bid package number four, which you all should have received a copy of. Um, it is roofing, so it's everything to do with roofing, including insulation and roof membranes and details around curbs and all things um, that have to do with buying out that scope of the work. And uh, drawings and specifications are completed. And what we are asking is for permission to give it to Bill Bain so that they can take it out to bid and to submit it to RIDE uh, so that they can do their review uh, piece as well. Are there any questions? Somebody want to make a motion first? So moved. And a second, please. Second. Okay, thank you. Any questions? No questions. Okay, so we will take a vote now. All the yeas, please uh, raise your hand. I'm going to do this, Lamb and Okay. Okay, any nays, please raise your hand high so we could see them. So that looks unanimous to me. Thank you very much, Kathy. Okay, the next item. Uh, next item is Slam Amendment number one. It's for Fuss and O'Neill for environmental consulting for additional services to do construction administration. You want to just give a brief overview, Kathy? Sure. This is to do the air monitoring and sampling and um, all, the, all the work that's required to watch that piece of construction as it's ongoing. Um, a majority of it has been completed. I'm not sure if they're 100% done yet, uh, but they have been out on site doing the work um, in anticipation of this being approved. Any questions? Okay, do we have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you. I will second. <laughs> um, and um, are there any questions? I do want to say this was a requirement, really. So we've actually already started, they've already started doing this work. So um, if there's no questions, then everybody who's a yay, please raise your right hand. Okay, and anybody who's a nay, please uh, raise it very high. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. Next item. 
Okay, the next item we had is was based on synthetic field discussion. Um, so we could we could hold that until after we have a, a presentation about the synthetic field. Um, okay, um, I think let's do the Pell actions and then we're gonna do that one before people leave and we'll take a vote be before anybody leaves the building. <laughs> if you've gotta leave, you gotta come here and tell me because we're gonna take a vote. Thank you. All right, for the Pell, we had to start off, they were for information as, as if needed, they would be for action. The first one was the added fence at the perimeter. I'm not sure if we have that agenda item to put up. I think everybody got it in their packet. My recollection, it was about the, can you tell us the amount? Do you have that right in front of you, Joe? I, do not. I can't see the no. screen. Okay. Well, take the mic and put it in your hand, and then you can walk. It's on a wire it. today. There you go. Oh, there we go. So we had a couple of options as far as the the um, where is that fence? Is this the back fence? That's the wrong. That's, yeah, that's um, the other one. That's Rogers. What is this? No, it's behind the bus loop. Yeah, it's on the other side. So it was on that. It was actually on that. I'm sorry. Kathy, if you can go back. It was there. Oh. It's in the bottom, the bottom left. Bottom left. Over here. There you go. Okay. So we have a couple of options for removal of the existing fence and installing uh, a six foot fence with the hedge slats. A 10 foot fence, right? Uh, well, this is a six foot, an eight foot, and a 10 foot oh, okay. are our options. Um, I know that we are getting um, some complaints from the neighbors about um, potentially you know, being able to see visibly the buses as well as some interaction with some potential neighborhood kids or, or just individuals that are out here. So option number one is for a six foot fence with the hedge slats, 35,000. Option number two is for an eight foot high fence with the hedge slats at 49,500. And then a 10 foot fence with the hedge slats at $57,400. So I think our recommendation was with the 10 foot high fence. Um, this way it would give us the, the best um, privacy screening for our neighbors. Um, and vice versa, uh, you know, nobody could look in at the kids as well during that school period as well. Right. And also just because kids have been jumping over the fence and because the bus loop is much higher, it got built up higher, just like the original Pell one did. So they're looking up at the bus loop. So the 10 feet is really required privacy and also to make sure they don't, students can't jump over it. Um, okay, do we want to have a motion by anybody here, please, today? So moved. For the 10 foot fence, for correct? The 10 foot recommendation okay. is 10 feet. Thank you. Second by Kendra. Uh, any other questions? What's that? Oh, the cost is $5,700 for the option three, which is the 10 foot high, 49500 for option two for the eight foot high fence and 35,978 for the six foot high. And I, I'm just gonna say, because the neighbors have been very good neighbors and put up with a lot, we think that it's worth the money. Okay, okay so uh, are there any other questions or should we take a vote? Okay, at all in favor, please raise your right hand. Okay, thank you. And anybody against it, please raise your right hand. Real high. <laughs> <laughs> I see none, thank you. So unanimous again. All right. Yeah, the next item is the revisions for the, uh, at the bus drop off. Is that on this document as well? Is that it? We 
we could we could go to the union fence and show. Four buses dropping off at the same time or picking up the yeah, down here, right? Day instead of just three, so we'll really expedite. Yeah. So, Scott, I'll hand you the mic. You could just go through what it is. Uh, sure. So they're going to make an adjustment to the uh, apron that was put in uh, to raise elevation, and at the same time, extend the sidewalk in some areas so a fourth bus um, can offload in that same area. Uh, we recently received the PCO um, from BN for $4,300 for, for that work. Um, <clears throat> so that will be discussed um, further. Um, in addition to that, um, we have the revisions to the parent drop off, which is across the street. Um, so, no. we're going to go around each one at a time. Okay? Yeah. So, Certainly. Um, That was forty three hundred thirteen dollars and eighteen cents. This is question. this increase is because of the additional slab we're going to put down to enable for more buses to unload at the same time. Yes, this is for a fourth bus. There were three that were offloading. Thank you. So, second. second. The fix, yes, I do have a question. The fix for the slope, that is not being charged back to us or anything like Correct. that? Correct. All right, thank you. All nays, raise your right hand high. <laughs> I'm dying to do it. I'm going to vote against something tonight. Thank you. 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 Thank and I don't see the uh, the swing gate portion that was involved uh, on this particular map, but um, that change order also came in <clears throat> from being at a cost of sixteen thousand five eighty three fifty one. So there'll be modifications to these areas. And that is for the purpose of um, routing people in and out of the parking lot, um, reduce congestion, um, give a little bit more swing so people coming out of the parking lot can make the, uh, the uh, bus loop or the bus drop off area in front of the school a little more readily without um, missing it. It, would it um, would it be okay to defer this for one more week? Yeah, the, the only issue with these two particular change orders, they said the mobilization um, for the site contractor would be three to five weeks out, and knowing that we're getting into the colder weather, and, uh, and paving does close any time from December 1st on. Um, it's likely that we'll get into the middle of the month of December before that happens, but timing-wise, um, to put it on the clock to say that it's moving forward would be advisable at this time. And then we can certainly uh, um, look into the, uh, the particulars and share that with the group. The reason I ask about deferring it is because I believe a couple of people did not feel it was necessary to widen that area. Or, and also that the design being, if you noticed, advised against it. Right. So anybody want to put a motion, please? Uh, so moved for discussion. Thank you. Second. Second. Bill. Um, I guess just along that line, we, just so people can understand what this is, is right when you come into the parking lot, on the left-hand side, there's a tiny little piece of 
cycle. And in drop off in the morning, it's um, very tight. So it would be, if you just widen it just that two and a half feet, it would be far more safe. Right now we have Mr. Newsom um, directing traffic, and he's just like, um, people are just too frightened to come in and out of there at the same time without a human being there. So they were going to put out cones, but I still personally, so, you know, they'd be more likely to be able to go in because the cones would be there. But I just feel from a safety standpoint at an elementary school, in my opinion is that it would be the right thing to do to widen it. So if we have to go forward with it um, and have to vote, I still think in another week we would. We, um, we could get it a, just a tiny bit more, but I still think I'm pretty set on my opinion. Why does B and not recommend it? The original design for when the traffic goes through is supposed to use the gate. So the gate is supposed to be open, so it's blocking anyone from going out the entrance and instead taking that new exit. The problem with that is when they go to swing, when the parent goes to swing to drop off, they miss at least three, three car lengths, three available spots to drop off. So I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. I'm ready to vote tonight. Okay. I just I just wanted I'm, to bring that to everyone. I'm sorry, Polly. <laughs> Could you explain that one more time? I couldn't quite picture it. Sure. So the design that Studio J presented to Pell has the routing going around the field across the street, which has been tremendous. It's such a big, you know, first day of school, we had people applauding it and so happy. When you're coming out and exiting the parking lot, the gate is supposed to be blocking anyone from going out the entrance. And that forces the cars, the parents, to come across there. And it misses probably three to four car lengths opportunities for additional cars to be dropping off. It cuts their ability to turn more and park up a little bit more to the top. So the thinking, I think, is presently what happens is when the gate is not opened and blocking from the entrance. Cars are going out the entrance, which was not the design purpose. And being brothers felt that was one unsafe because they could turn right or left. You could have people coming in that entrance and someone taking a left to head towards Hellside. So possibility right there. And it doesn't keep um, entering and exiting cars separate. So widening it wouldn't, there would be no, no longer preventing the cars from going the wrong way through that entrance. Correct. It would not fix the direction of cars entering or exiting. But to Luis's point, it does help alleviate the tight turn and less possibility, you know, there's more room for cars. Is there another, I mean, I'm concerned about having the <coughs> entrance still open so that folks can exit through the entrance because, I mean, I'm sure that that's a danger. So is, would there be another plan in the future if it is widened to still prevent people from being able to go the wrong way? I think maybe only with signage, and you do have uh, a traffic monitor out there actually working the traffic um, as it goes. I did take some video and some photographs of you know the, the interactions in that spot as it is. I will make note that the um, portion of the the sidewalk and the curbing here has you know previously been damaged uh, by snow plows and years of. But so it's 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 something that needs to be addressed. Um, at some point regardless. Um, and, and this is just an effort to uh, make the, the flow of the traffic patterns in and out uh, a little more readily 
accessible and safer. Um, and again, it, this, uh, this drop off period and uh, pickup period requires a, a monitor in the street. Um, and, you know, we have video of that interaction, you know, of uh, the directionalization and, uh, you know, some people that would have to exit around and, and not make the opportunity to drop off the kids at the front. And I think that actually you put cones up to make it more, uh, not a permanent thing like current um, parking cutouts that they have done. The problem with the cutouts is that, in fact, in front of Pell, when we come up, there's a very long area which is for cars we only, right now, the way it is set up is you can really only get like one or two in there. And particularly, as Mr. Nixon was saying, is that in the east, at the end of the day, parents come and they have given a bus number and then they text into their children and then the kids come out. So really lining up as many cars as possible in front of the school is critical for getting kids out into the parent cars. Um, I just wonder, I mean, is it, I wonder about the safety aspect of it though, if we're still gonna have, I mean, I, th I think what we would still see potentially people going out the wrong way and, and, and pre presenting a safety issue with that. Right. I think that that's actually what this is designed to do, is to let them come out the same entryway as they always do. So that they don't have to get in the Having watched it, and again, we can, I don't know, maybe Tracy, you're the best person to talk about it, but um, your opinion on the safety aspects of it versus. And our intent is still to have someone out there directing traffic. Also, almost every day, Officer Nick, our community officer, is out there for people who try to go the wrong way, you know, <laughs> which does happen still. But cars are just they're not able to make that sharp turn when they come. And to your point, it's only allowing us to have two parents along the side school where we could have four. But you don't know until you start doing it every day and you have large amounts of cars and everything. And it's really working well. And I think this is just the, like, the little thing we have to fix because parents are happy. The bus loop's working well. But then once I started doing it, I thought, well, oh, if I could load four buses at a time, if we had this, you know, until you kind of live in it every day, you're just trying to make, you know, you, your best thinking is on paper until you start doing it. So, so you, you recommend this? Yes. Okay. Well, I have a question just, um, so if Ben is, is suggesting that it's making the area less safe, so by implication, the, whatever traffic engineers at Jade Studio works with that otherwise would have designed the improvements to the parking lot and making that same conclusion, which means ultimately the observations of, of I'll call them the late, the non-construction individuals are, are prevailing here, which I think to me creates a liability issue if something does happen there. So if I could jump in, I was actually gonna step in. I would make a recommendation, I think Mr. Nicholson just hit on it, is I was gonna say, we are meeting next week. I think it would be a very good idea to have our traffic consultant come in and actually provide us a presentation, uh, the plus and minus of making the changes. Um, I tend to agree with the principal. I think that making some of these tweaks are helpful. Um, I just came from that area. I know exactly what the issue is, um, but I'd like to hear what some of the concerns are uh, from the contractor. Um, and I think having the actual a uh, traffic engineer here to present to us um, and then we can make a decision. I think one week um, is not going to be detrimental to the schedule. We're going to release them anyways to come and start working on the bus loop. So the, that same contractor will be here anyways. When will our next meeting be? Next week. Next, next month. Week. Next Monday. Yes. Monday. Next yes. Monday. Oh. Would we have to vote to defer? You could just either table it if you want to table it to next week. But does that need a vote is my question. I haven't been, okay, okay. Uh -huh. okay. So we'll just defer that one. Thank you. Next week. Next month. And we'll we'll have the traffic consultant here um, to provide a presentation. Uh, there's no other action. No. I want to thank the city manager because that, when we had the contractor yeah, not right. liking it, made me wonder. Yeah.
I think that concludes the action items that we had. Uh, well, we had another one with the irrigation control that, that was for information and then ultimately for action, but that I think that we still need to talk with uh, the contractor about if that's a contingency or design issue versus a change order. Go to the um, synthetic turf field first, and we can do a vote on that before sure. we have to leave. Sure. So, Kathy, you have a consultant, our Eddie, yeah. right? He was here from Traverse, I believe. It. Right. He had presented last time. There he is. He looks happy. <laughs> <laughs> Art, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. So I know we, we asked you to come and provide, I guess, a presentation to talk about a couple of very specific items. Are you prepared? And ready? Yep. All right. Can I share my screen? Is that possible? Or is the presentation up? Do you want us to run the presentation? We could do that. Yeah, I think that would help. Yeah, you should be able to see it. Yeah, sorry, I can't see it, but hold on, let me see if I can fix that. So I can't see the actual presentation, but that's okay. If... Ah, there we go. All set? Yeah. So if you want to just, I'll dive right in if that's okay. Yes, please. Uh, if you can go to the next screen, um, so we talked about this a little bit the last time I was there. Um, my synthetic turf, again, safety and consistency across the field. Um, the biggest uh, use for synthetic turf is playability. Uh, obviously, get more hours of use um, than you can um, out of a natural grass field, which is the biggest value that comes out of um, synthetic turf. Um, there is a variable of maintenance versus value. So there is um, less maintenance, um, but there's obviously a considerable upfront cost. Um, and then water conservation. Uh, so you're obviously not watering fields. So, um, but I think I mentioned in the past, the, the biggest reason is those extra hours of use um, and high use on those fields. Um, you're really building the value of three fields in one, um, which when you have limited space, um, obviously expands uh, what you can do athletically. Can you go to the next slide? So, uh, Concerns about uh, crime rubber. So there was a discussion. I think one of the questions was a discussion about cancer um, and the concerns about cancer. Um, so roughly in the state of Massachusetts, um, and there are roughly over 300 synthetic turf fields that utilize sand and recycled rubber. Uh, that number has grown even more substantially uh, since um, we've got this stat, which is about five years old. Uh, there are another two to three hundred more in New England states surrounding Massachusetts which is utilizing similar systems. So there are a lot of systems uh, out there that use um, crumb rubber and a mixture of sand. Um, one of the biggest um, releases that came out was through the EPA. Uh, in 2019, they released what was part one of their synthetic turf field tire crumb rubber research uh, under the Federal Research Action Plan. Um, this was uh, basically an internal review. There's 110 studies on crumb rubber um, that were professionally um, reviewed uh, by the EPA. So this was part one of that action plan. There were also some uh, discussions about the need for more um, studies, um, which was supposed to come out in part two. 
Um, part two was delayed uh, due to some administration changes um, and also to COVID, which kind of slowed down the release of part two. But what came out of the early studies of concentration was one, um, in chrome rubber, there is no doubt materials that are carcinogenic, um, that are part of their makeup. But what came out of those studies was is there's no way from a bioaccessibility standpoint for you to transfer um, either through gastric fluids or saliva um, to have it in your body long enough to actually transfer uh, cancer into your, your body. And that was true. Those studies covered a wide ranges of dermal. So if you had cuts uh, or abrasions and you got it in your skin, uh, it was breathing. Um, so in, inhalation and then also um, actually if you actually um, ate it. So if it, it was ingested. Um, so it covered that wide range of studies. Um, and again, um, we continue to expect to see more information from state and federal government agencies. Uh, currently, um, right now, the Rhode Island Department of Health will provide a letter, which we've asked for in the past, um, giving their understanding of crumb rubber um, and their understanding of the EPA um, release part one, um, indicating that it doesn't actually have an impact um, on from a cancer standpoint. Um, there are some other studies out there um, that California did. California did a pretty extensive um, study on abrasion um, and, and getting it into your skin. Um, they looked at a lot of um, what that impact was and found no impact. Um, and so this um, has been the most major study that has come out in the most recent. If you would like to see those studies, there's over 110 of them. Um, I've read pretty much all of them. Um, you can get them on the Synthetic Turf Council's website. Um, they actually provide all of the studies and they range from um, putting them in the ground and burying them and what happens. There was um, studies that were, again, ingestion on mice, um, just a wide range of studies um, that uh, came from that. Um, but what we do understand um, is that there is also obviously the perception uh, of the concern of cancer uh, with crumb rubber. Um, so that has led to a kind of a wide range of changes in the synthetic turf industry, looking at uh, a, a variety of opportunities for different infills. And I will talk more to that uh, as I go through the presentation. Um, this is kind of uh, any questions on this information. So if you want to slide to the next thing, the next concern was about lower leg extremity um, and kind of epidemiology, epidemiological research. Um, and the big questions out there is, is there a difference in injury risk on synthetic turf and natural grass? Um, are there different types of injuries that occur on synthetic turf? Um, one of the things um, that has been really, really challenging is that there's not really good studies um, on kind of lower leg extremity. They're mostly related to football and soccer and, and actually lean more towards heavily towards soccer. So the information that we have is related from, from uh, FIFA and their studies. Um, and then there's a variability of injuries. Um, so you also have contact versus non-contact injury. So if you're hit and you're hitting the knee, um, that can create an injury if you plant your foot. So those are two different types of injury. Um, there's been extensive studies and the NFL has spent a, uh, a fair amount of money on looking at cleat type and how cleat type impacts. So there's uh, an extensive understanding of um, the best cleats. Some cleats are better than others. Um, weather conditions, so there's not a lot of 
uh, record data on weather conditions, um, who records the data in type, so where that information is coming from, um, and statistically we need large sample sizes are needed um, for this information, um, and which is one of the reasons why um, at this conference now, because I'm on the performance and guidelines, um, and we're really pushing this type of information along um, to keep advancing it. Um, one of the things that we found is that many of the peer-reviewed studies were done on uh, first and second generation artificial turf surfaces um, and were compared to natural grass. Um, and what they've seen is um, some of the more recent studies when they start to get on third generation turf um, that we're starting to see a lot more comparable data. And I'll get into in a little bit about what is first through actually fourth generation um, to give you some more information. But if you can go to the next slide. So one of the one of the places um, that does a fair amount of research on sports surfaces is Penn State, uh, the Penn State Center for Sports Surface Research. Um, they looked at 12 scientific injury studies published on infill synthetic turf for natural grass and peer reviewed. Uh, as you can see, um, pretty heavily rated on soccer. Um, um, so there are nine of them are in soccer. A lot of them are uh, from Europe. Uh, they range from professional to youth, boys and girls in games first practice. Um, there are two for football, uh, one collegiate, so the NCAA is doing a fair amount of study uh, looking at synthetic turf and then high school. And then rugby, the World Rugby Association has their study. Um, what they found was the no study found a higher overall injury rate, but there is some uh, differences in lower length angles, so some types of injury um, to angles and, and are more common and some less common on synthetic turf, so they kind of range, some, some on grass, some on synthetic. There's also actually an interesting component that um, between male and females, there's uh, different injuries that are occurring on different types of surfaces. Uh, if you go to the next slide. So the data from Penn State, so when they did their peer review, what they found was um, synthetic turf, higher incidence, there was a higher incidence of zero daytime loss injuries. So what that means is um, an injury that you come out of the game and you go back into the game. So things like um, just tired muscles, things like that, not necessarily sprains or injuries. Um, there was a significant higher incidence of non-contact injuries. So kind of I plant my foot, does something happen? Um, there was a significant higher incidence of surf surface and epidural injuries, so abrasion. So am I, am I getting... Um, scrapes when I'm on the surface. And then obviously one of the downsides of synthetic turf is heat. Um, so an injury is during higher temperatures. So um, when you're on a very hot field, you start to get tired and you see kind of a natural higher uh, occurrence of injuries from that. On natural grass higher incidents, um, we're seeing a, a higher incidence of head and neural trauma and then ligament injuries. And the caveat to that is those studies that were done were on dry fields. So most injury occurred on very dry fields. So any of those fields that are really firm, really hard, um, don't have that soft cushion you're seeing. So that, that kind of makes sense to why we're seeing those types of injuries. So can we go to the next slide? So how do we combat um, some of these lower leg extremity injuries and how do we, so as me as a designer, um, how do I approach um, looking at what's best um, for your community, also looking at best for what's best for the athlete. So we, we take three things uh, into account. One is safety. Um, obviously, we start with safety, so anything that we can do to make a field safer, um, we make sure um, that that's on the top of the, our list of what we're doing. Uh, and then we look at performance and consistency. So if we can make a field, if we can make the ball play better uh, and feel more like a natural grass field, and we can make that field consistent. So consistent play is one of the things that 
athletes want the most out of their surfaces more than anything. Um, there are some psychological studies on injuries um, that are coming out of Colorado and out of the UK that are talking about if the field, if the actual field performs better, the athlete actually feels better about it. So if we can create a surface that's really um, playing well and consistent and then durability, um, obviously we have to balance between performance safety and longevity. Um, so we're, we look at those three pieces of the pie and make sure that we're kind of balancing all those things. Can you go to the next slide? So how do we do that? So if we look and go back through, and I started to talk a little bit about where some of these injury occurrence were, if we start with generation one uh, synthetic turf, generation one synthetic turf was the Astrodome. Um, so it's a nylon fibered, uh, very short pile um, a grass rug that was glued over concrete or asphalt. Some of them had cushions underneath them, but most were glued directly to um, concrete. Um, and that obviously was not very positive. It was a very um, dangerous surface, um, had a lot to do with head injuries and also lower leg extremities. So in the 70s, uh, the introduction of polypropylene fiber, which was less abrasive, um, still a short pile height, um, but then filled with purely sand. Um, again, a very firm, hard surface, so very hard on the legs, uh, very uh, high when you impact that surface, um, which led to the 2000s um, and really started in the 90s was the introduction of a soft grass like polypropylene fiber. So they thinned up that fiber a little bit, made it look more like grass, made it feel more, more like grass and started to add a mixture of sand and rubber um, that was used to improve traction, uh, impact safety from a an impact standpoint, and then the softness underfoot. Um, typically, those those surfaces were somewhere between two and two and a half inches um, with two inches of sand rubber. So early on, this was a big um, improvement over um, kind of older generations because now we were starting to get a softer surface. So um, sports like football, where you're impacting that surface, surface was much softer, the athlete. Um, but it had some faults um, because what was the high focus was on that head injury criteria. So on that head injury impact, um, that was um, kind of what safety was all about. So you were getting this really high sand field. So what you'll see is um, they started to feel uh, almost like playing on cheese um, or like a, a, the moon. So it was just a very, very bouncy um, but it had a lot of impact on that kind of lower leg extremity. So when we moved into the, the last 10 years, um, we started to see a mixture of fibers, so polyethylene fibers um, and then sand and rubber infill. Um, and then there was the introduction of the shock pad. Um, so the shock pad created that layer underneath um, that created that cushion. Um, and early on, it still kind of had the same effect. We were able to take some of the infill out of that, that synthetic turf um, and then put um, kind of keep that sand. So there was this really, again, kind of bouncy feel, but there was the, the, the impact was going dramatically down. And I'll, I'll talk a little more about what exactly that means. Um, and then this is what we're calling Generation four, um, we're the only ones that are calling it that, so it doesn't. That's not actually an industry standard, but it's um, it's the use of this again, these polyethylene fibers, and again, looking at a mixture of fibers. And again, I'll get a little more into that. Um, a mixture of sand and natural infills. So again, looking at a wide range of different types of infills, reducing the overall pile height down to two inches uh, and some inches to one and three quarters. Um, and then that performance pad underneath. Um, and what we've done is actually increased more sand back into that field um, to give that field uh, a more firmer feel so that it, it actually plays underfoot um, a little better. So you want to go to the next slide? 
So how do we accomplish that? Again, one of the, um, the only requirement in the United States um, is to have a value of 200 GMAX, which is this GMAX, um, is the only requirement for synthetic turf in the United States. You cannot have a GMAX over 200. So what GMAX is, is they actually take a 20-pound missile and they drop it on the field. Um, they get back what is called a G. Um, natural grass is somewhere between 80 and 100 Gs. Um, and again, keep in mind the low GMAX doesn't mean necessarily mean there is a lack of stability in the playing surface. Um, a typical, if we took like a three and a half or a three G system um, over time, which is just a sand rubber field over stone base, uh, you would get about 140 or somewhere over 140 uh, GMAX. So lower number is, um, is softer, higher number is harder. Um, and what we found with the 4G systems is that um, with the shock pad, we're actually getting down to natural grass. Uh, even over time, we're down in the 80s, 90s, and 100s. Um, that really um, is changing the dynamic of what that GMAX is. Um, again, so that has to deal with head injury criteria. Go to the next slide. Um, so this is a relatively new test. Uh, again, this has to do with head injury criteria. Um, this is called HIC, which is head injury criteria. Um, the reason for this development, um, and it comes from the audio industry. So the audio industry, audit, auto industry has been using HIC since 1995. Um, in uh, 2016, the playground surfacing has adopted it. And the reason that they adopted it is this shape of the testing equipment. Um, so it's a 10 pound piece of equipment that is a hemisphere projectile, which means it acts more like a human head. So it actually interacts with the surface more like a human head than, than, than GMAX does. Um, and what this does is um, allows us to look at um, readings uh, that you can see in the chart uh, kind of on the upper right. Um, the two bars, the yellow and the red bar, um, uh, equal to critical head injury, and then the red bar is fatal. So we can look at that point where it reaches a thousand. Um, we know that if we can get an HIC over a thousand, we know that we're outside of critical head injury and outside of fatal head injury. Um, so again, this just gives us a point, but we look at the world rugby um, has a requirement for critical fall height. So as obviously as you go higher, there's a certain level um, where you drop it from uh, that has to be greater than 1.3 meters or uh, four foot three inches. So if you figure the typical athlete, if you pick that athlete up fully in the air and drop them down on their head, that would have to be safer than that. Um, and with pads, um, we're seeing upwards of 1.6, 1.7, but we do have a requirement of 1.3. Next slide. I, I do. Yeah. Excuse me? I just had a question. Uh, in yeah. terms of the HIC, when you say that you have a requirement of 1.3, does that mean that any of the turf fields that you build has to have a critical fall height of at least 1.3 meters? Yeah, so um, again, when we when we design um, fields, uh, we currently use a shot pad, and then we require that that, that height of 1.3 meters, uh, they have to exceed that. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so again, do GMAX and HIC give you a full evaluation of the performance of the field and its safety characteristics? So the answer is no. Um, if you go to the next slide. We start to look again, and this is where we get into lower leg extremities. So we start to look at vertical deformation. Um, and vertical deformation is a test of the hardness or softness, um, but this is in direct relation to uh, stability of the foot when it hits the field. Um, so if we get a vertical deformation that's reading that's too high, obviously then that field is very soft um, and your ankles 
kind of roll and your your feet and ankles roll in those directions. Uh, if it's too low, then it's really hard. And then again, you're putting excess strain on that joint and muscle um, from that standpoint. So we're looking at vertical deformation, uh, understanding kind of where um, we start to uh, get that balance and it is a little bit of a balance and that's why I, I get into it's a systems design because we have to take into fact GMAX and critical fall height but we're also trying to balance now the hardness and softness for that kind of leg extremity. If you go to the next slide. So we also look at force reduction. Again, this is also a test of the hardness or softness under the foot, but this one is in direct relation to, uh, to running. Um, so if, uh, again, a, a force reduction is too high, um, think of it being a really soft and it gets uh, starts to feel like a beach. Um, so all that energy in the athlete when they go to run is bouncing back into their legs, basically. So it's creating this kind of um, forced energy that's coming back in their legs. And, and the opposite is, um, if it's too hard, then it's really compacting in those knee joints and all the way up through that spinal column. So when you're planting foots, and this really comes into play uh, kind of in that um, slow speed where you're at a speed and then you break into a fast sprint, um, this is where that really comes into play. Um, so making sure that that kind of is in the balance um, and, and that we're not uh, too high, too low. And all of these um, kind of ranges that we picked came from kind of the FIFA standards um, for soccer. Um, so they have kind of a standard in Europe that they meet certain levels of fields. These are, we don't necessarily certify these fields like they do in Europe, but we're still kind of meeting their, their testing requirements. To go to the next one. One of the ones that we feel is also, this is one of the more critical ones. This is rotational resistance. Um, so uh, with a high end natural feel, obviously you get a certain amount of slippage uh, and a certain amount of cleat grab. So it, it's a, it's kind of a critical point. And this is the one that where you're planting your foot and you're cutting and turning. Um, if it's too high, um, it, it almost becomes an uh, excessive grip. So this is where you can kind of plant your foot and rotate on your knee and start to get in those knee injuries. Um, so you, all those joints knee all the way down through the ankle. Um, and then if it's too low, players are more likely to slip and then have lose confidence in their footing and holding. Um, it makes changing direction really difficult and and slipping can result in those kind of overextension injuries, so where you're actually turning and you're overextending your legs um, and can create that rotational. So this is that kind of idea of coming up as an athlete, making a move and cutting to the left or cutting to the right. Um, we, again, we're looking at a balance and we have a range where we meet um, the certifications for this. You go to the next slide. And then some simple, as we talked a little bit about the confidence in athletes, uh, is looking at ball, ball rebound and ball roll. Um, again, if a ball is coming off a surface and it uh, bounces unusually high or bounces, we're really looking for the quality of play that it actually starts to react like grass does. Um, we look at ball roll to make sure that there's a consistent roll across um, the field, um, that fibers aren't laying flat. And um, again, we feel like this is actually impacting not only the performance of the play, but also impacting um, how the athletes feel about safety and confidence uh, in the field itself. Next slide. Again, one of the critical components is, uh, is infiltration. So making sure that the surface is not wet um, again, you get that kind of sliding things. Um, so one of the critical components of a synthetic turf is moving water through that surface. Um, this is what you see on your left is called a dual ring infiltrometer. Um, we have um, a, a rate of inches per hour that they need to move through the system, which is intended to measure the actual field store, storing capacity. Um, when we build a field, it's built with really clean stone so that water is moving through it, but it's also moving through that entire system over a period of time. Next slide. And then planarity. Um, so 
Um, with plenary, we're looking at um, basically three different layers. Um, one is when we actually, before the, the carpet goes down, um, we're actually checking with a three meter rod um, that there can't be any more than an eighth inch and 10 feet, so eight millimeters. Um, any of those areas are repaired prior to laying the carpet. Um, and then same thing happens when we actually lay the actual synthetic turf and then we fill infill. Um, we make sure those infill depths are all within that range, again, less than an eighth of an inch and ten. And again, what, what this does is create a consistent surface, which is predictable. The ball roll is predictable and the safety of the surface because of the athlete's confidence in the surface. This also speaks to maintenance long term. It is understanding that infill heavily impacts the use of the field, so maintaining those infills are really critical. Next slide. So that's kind of lower leg extremity. So in our specifications, we require all that testing. Um, again, some of it is done. There is a whole gamut of testing that happens about the carpet itself, the, the, the performance of the system itself, which we require the manufacturer to do. Um, some of those are related to longevity, quality of material, and some of those are related to safety. Um, and then obviously all those are um, completed in the field prior to the field being turned over. Is there any questions on that? I know it's highly technical, so I, I'm trying to simplify it the best I can. <laughs> I had a question just in terms of um, the ratings for all those different turf systems. Um, do you have a kind of a comparison in terms of those different turf systems, how they compare uh, to each other, but also to a natural grass field? I, I don't know if, I mean, I, I recognize that these are more for performance and durability, but I guess in like looking at all of those form all of the um, previous slides with the safety questions. Yeah, I I kind of heard some of it. This is a little difficult to hear, but um, I think I know what you you're asking. So obviously the FIFA standards are like those are the we're looking at premier grass fields, right? Um, so we're looking at what a premier grass field and how it will perform and trying to mimic those exact types of um, characteristics. So um, that's where those FIFA kind of mesh with what um, the grass, natural grass fields are. And again, a high performing natural grass field, something like a sand cap natural grass field. Um, we can now modify that system based on as as we go through kind of if you decide to move forward um, uh, with the synthetic turf um, moving forward, we'll go through and start to build a system and understand how we can build that system. And the way we can modify that system is we start to look at the amount of infill versus the amount of sand. Um, and what the shock pad is doing. So different shock pads behave different ways. Um, different infills behave different ways. And there's plus and minuses on, on all of them. And then we try to modify that system to make sure we can still meet those, those um, ranges in that certification. Does, did that answer your question? Kind of. I mean, I guess I just... <sighs> I'll just ask the like question that is probably not even answerable, but can you say like is what is like a turf field is it or grass field safer or is it just a purely pro and con depending on the type of injury? I, I missed that last one. I'm sorry. Or is it purely just a pro and con depending on the type of injury and depending on the field? Yeah, I'm having trouble hearing. Try Jamie since you have a mask on. I think I understand your question. It, it's the distinction between a, a, the grass field and a synthetic field and the, the relative injury um, comparison. Is a synthetic field in some way characteristically stronger than, from an injury standpoint, stronger or better than a grass field or vice versa? I think that's what, what you're trying to say. Is it, is it better or worse? Um, it it, it's a it's a good question. I mean, I we can build. I, I think both have their value. Um, I don't know that um, 
it's hard to say one is better or worse than the other. Um, I think, I mean, again, I think there's definitely an athlete's preference to play on grass. Um, but there's also, um, when you start to look at um, kind of more modern synthetic turf systems and the longevity. And so when you start to look at uh, on a overused grass field, um, I think it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's the high propensity for injury is higher on an overused grass field um, versus kind of a, a really good grass field. And, and I think that's the challenge when we talk about synthetic turf, we're comparing to really good grass fields that were, um, that were taken care of. Um, so I think they both have their use. I think the, the synthetic turf system provides a lot more use um, at a level that's more consistent than grass. Are all grass fields um, done the same, or is there a difference in the way that, 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 you know, is there a higher quality way of doing a grass field? And, you know, what, I'm just curious. I... Yeah, so, yeah, so, I mean, just s similar to, Similar to synthetic turf, I mean, the way I approach a lot of athletic projects is um, is really looking at systems. I mean, uh, uh, a system that is really heavy in sand. So you can imagine a grass system that has a lot of sand underneath it um, is really firm, plays really fast, and is is a really high quality field. Um, so you can build a really really great grass field um it's extremely hard to maintain um because there's no there's no real organic layers in it so you're, you're constantly putting inputs like fertilizer um you're constantly mowing water um because obviously in a sand system they're moving really it's moving really faster so through that Scott wheeler who's from the city the director of parks and recreation who, who does grass fields all the time and scott maybe you could yeah. help out here because I know you've answered this question for me probably 300 times before. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a, a, a parks and rec field is probably, a, 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 again, a good parks and rec field is going to be um, kind of a native um, layer of soil, um, six inches deep. You'll have some drainage. Um, the challenge with that is it, it comes down to use and um, use and maintenance. constant inputs of fertilizer, pesticide, water. They're unheard of for the most part in most municipal. Uh, so what we're really looking at is the only option is a native soil field. Now, if we could limit the use to just games and have an ideal maintenance, but I think we need to go into this realizing this is a school facility, so we're not going to be putting any inputs of uh, pesticides, no grub control, no crab grass control, and usage is extremely difficult to limit. It's just a reality. So what we're really talking more about is a compacted native soil field where we would go around and try to maintain grass. So when you get to safety about um, GMAC and GMAC, it's going to be a very compacted field. We're not going to be able to maintain a full grass cover, so those slipping trees slide into you know, plenty of examples of that. So, so that's the challenge. If you're really comparing it to hopefully a well maintained municipal, but a municipal school field where you have limits on the use of pesticides and pesticides. Um, and because we're so in poor, the usage is going to be very high. So certainly as someone that is managing uh, for the last five years and managing uh, city grass fields for 25 years, I feel confident that the synthetic turf is significantly safer and more predictable um, because it's going to play the same way and then after, or, or close to the same way. Uh, where if you end up to a grass field today and then somebody on it, they're going to be sliding injuries, you know, 
associated with that. Um, so, so that's one of the challenges. To my knowledge, not you may know, there really is a good comparison of uh, native soil or distal fields comparing that with synthetic turf. No, I mean, the that's one of the challenges with the with the data is that there's the the majority of the studies are coming from kind of the upper level um, organizations like FIFA. Um, there are pretty limited studies on grass um, as an overall from like a parks rec um, type level of where those fields are. I can't, he's not going to be able to hear you unless you're on a mic. This is more a comment for the group than for the presenter. So we talked last time about um, a 2019 University Hospitals data study, right? So they looked at 28 high schools from an orthopedic perspective that they serviced. They had a couple thousand injuries. They found a 58% high incident of injury on artificial turf versus a grass field. And the other data point that people should be aware of is the NFL Players Association position on artificial turf is it should all be replaced with natural grass because they find a 68% higher uh, non-contact uh, injury incident. So it's just a couple of data points. Everybody wants to say it's safer. That's not what some of these other data points say. So it may challenge a confirmation bias for artificial turf, but we should be aware of that. And, and, and I would argue that comment with the nfl currently does not have a field with a shot pad in it there's not one field in, in the nfl that has a shot pad in it and i think that's again that, that's an open discussion and open issue with the nfl um but it is one of the reasons why their their fields are not um they, they, the players associate don't like those fields they're playing on third generation fields Two and a half inches, sand, rubber, 70% sand, 30% rubber. Plus, they're gonna, they're gonna, the NFL is going to have a natural grass field, for example. They're going to certainly have a better opportunity, resources, and care of the fields than, than we would on a local level from a, a natural grass. I mean, they're, 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 their grass fields are going to play like artificial turf and are, are going to be superior in terms of the maintenance and upkeep and all those things and, and we would. So I think what Scott Wheeler was talking about is the degradation of, of uh, local fields and the, along with the higher use. So I, I had one question about, um, when you're talking about what it sounded like um, designing the, the uh, synthetic fields, the different shock pads and things like that. So it, it, I guess my question is, is there no high school standard at all today that one can point to and say you should have a shock pad of whatever xyz you should have the height of the of the carpet being abc or anything like that uh unfortunately no um and again a good reason why i'm here in washington um is for that exact reason is again to continue to push um this idea of building safer systems. Um, it's the, the only requirement in the United States, the only current requirement is for GMAX. Um, so that's, it's the only requirement you have, you have to be, be below a GMAX of 200. Um, that's from the American Society's testing materials. Um, so there's really no actual agency and actually the NCAA is working um, feverishly to come up with a regulation. They don't actually have one currently. So, um, so the question I had was, um, I, I sent it over to Colleen maybe a month or two ago. There was an article in the Boston Globe about injuries in synthetic fields um, in Massachusetts and that they, they thought there was a, a, a higher well, there, there seemed to be a, a, a coming prevalence of a lot of injuries on synthetic fields in Massachusetts, which I think may have been attributable. I mean, the defenders of the fields were they're attributing the, the reasons for the, the lack of uh, maintenance or, or um, replacement of the fields, because I think they were, the fields were in excess of 15 to 20 years old. And so 
they're starting to see some problems in that regard. I don't know if you if, if you you're familiar with that at all. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm also very familiar with that, um, and that um, it's also <laughs> I, I own a synthetic turf maintenance company um, that I bought from the UK uh, for that exact reason. Uh, I was having clients that were. I, I don't want to, you know, synthetic turf is not maintenance free by any means. Um, it does require maintenance. And as you can see through a lot of the testing that we do, um, really requires, uh, it really is the interaction of infill and fiber. Um, so it's really at the surface level. Um, and one of the things that was happening was folks were driving fields to 15 years old, 16 year old and playing on fields that were very old. Um, there was fields that were, uh, have no infill and kind of almost down to the backing. So now all of a sudden you're playing on stone. Um, so it was a major concern for me. Um, and one of the things that we've seen across the industry is people are talking a lot more about maintenance, uh, and making sure that these things get maintained properly. Um, again, it's not complicated maintenance, um, but it does require maintenance. And, and some of those, you know, some of those failures are um, this field over time, any, any field, any infill is going to get compacted from play and you do need to break it up and loosen it um, over time. Um, so that, again, increases the playability, just like anything on maintenance that you would do. But yes, that, that system is, um, that the studies in Boston and understanding that are, are kind of why I'm doing what I'm doing now. <laughs> Uh, I'm wondering um, about this, the field at Salve, which is artificial. Um, how is that held up as far as maintenance? And do you know anything about the injuries? And sure. Right, right. right. Uh, you know, I am very familiar with it. I've been down to, to look at it. It is really a uh, very straightforward matter. We're sweeping, buffing the rubber, and then we have basically a bear. Um, on that equipment 
um, to make sure that everybody knows how to use it. Um, we also include testing through the life of the warranty, which is typically somewhere between eight and 10 years, depending on the turf. Um, and we also provide through the specifications annual maintenance um, so that a professional gets on it once a year through the manufacturer, um, just to make sure that that system operates. And that's something we've been doing um, for the last five or six years with our clients. More, not related to safety, but related to environmental impact. So, Scott, I think eventually you replace the green turf field, right? The plastic field eventually gets replaced at 10 or 12 years or something like that. Yes. So the, the carpet itself is about 40,000 pounds of plastic that goes essential to a landfill, right? We don't really recycle stuff. So that's nearly 1 million plastic water bottles every 10 years that we're committing to the agency carpet. When you think about plastic synthetic fields, so I think the committee should be aware of that also. Uh, On, on the same on the same kind of vein is there what is the drainage and like runoff situation with the turf fields we we have an issue in general in the city with stormwater runoff and all of that Someone remind me what the price tag we're looking at is again. So I, that's why I came up here to talk a little bit more detail. So first of all, Art, thank you very much for your time and your presentation. Um, so a couple things uh, to Mr. Wheeler's point. Um, I've constructed in, uh, a number of these fields and typically a synthetic field does drain much better if it's designed and constructed properly because uh, you do manage the water better than a grass field where sometimes it will go. So, 
So we do not have an actual cost for the synthetic field. Um, we are in the process of, of reviewing that. It is going to be several million dollars. We know that of an increase. Today, in our design, we do have a grass field that is part of the design. Uh, it's part of the construction documents. It's been part of the process. So tonight, if you would want to move forward for design services and, and moving this ahead, we'd be looking to add um, an amendment to SLAM's contract. That amendment would be approximately $178,000 to do the design services. That's for schematic design, design development, and construction documents. And if and then at that point, we would get further pricing from Gilbane. Gilbane would uh, procure those, and if we move forward, we'd know, you know, we'll have an estimate on it certainly beforehand. Um, but then there would be an additional thirty-three thousand dollars for construction administration and bidding as well. So just on the design side alone, you're looking at about two hundred and twelve thousand dollars, which is the only thing we could say for certainty right now. So we've, I've seen synthetic fields. Um, be very competitive right now and I've also seen some quotes that have come in that are not so competitive so it's you know in the market we're in right now it's it's kind of a, a, a tough guess so we are currently over the budget um, without the synthetic field by about uh, with the latest estimate about six million over still So then, um, that's a big number to proceed down this road. At least, I mean, if you would go the full the full route, I generally wouldn't have a problem with the design cost. But I guess my and I, I had thought about. I, I knew I was going to ask the same question that Pat did. Where we are. So if you're if if it if it's millions of dollars and those millions of dollars already exceed um what has been raised through bonding and bond premium and the like then what's it, you need to construct a field we know that you can't leave it out of the mix and 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 maybe you could you could do it later but so where i guess the question is not 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 for you joe but for the group is how do you pay for this yeah I mean, and, and i'll i'll answer it anyways uh, for well, I'll answer it my way that I would, yeah. I would say is the field is is literally going to be the last yeah. item that is constructed. It's going where the existing building is. So we do have time, right? Um, typically, if we wanted to look at an alternate material, you could design and bid it as an alternate. Unfortunately, with synthetic field, right. you really need to know what we're building there. So unfortunately, in this case, we really can't do it as an alternate and kind of throw both numbers out there and find out what it is, because then we would be designing it twice, really, in this case. Um, so yes, it, it is, um, you know, there is a differential in cost. We would have to find funding uh, or, um, you know, hopefully what, as the bids continue to come in, you know, maybe they'll come in, uh, you know, a little bit better. Uh, there might be some savings, but there's certainly no guarantee right now as to where it will be. Joe, is there a deduct to not do the grass design? There is, and uh, in the original estimate we received, that did include that. I think, was it two and a half million? Is that the right number? We threw around so many numbers and went back and forth. I don't want to be held to a number, but. So the, the question would be is, I think we've already designed that grass field. Yeah, so it's You're already doing it. Yeah, it's already it's done, it's done design right now. Yes. Is it, is it done? So that's something that's always confused me because the design is not done but we're gonna to continue to design it for the grass, even though, uh, all right, I'm gonna withdraw my statement. So is, is this is this a the synthetic field? I guess my question is, is this, a, is this another, a different issue than what what the exercises building committee should be going through? And that is, 
constructing within the param I guess within the parameters of the authorized amounts. And I, so I guess my question in that regard is, and, and I, I'm not sure if you answered it, Joe, is if a, if a grass field were to go in with this project, can, you could do a synthetic field at another time. It's going to be more costly probably, but you could always do the synthetic field at another time in which various groups could seek the funding, whether it be strictly public funds or some or private funds. Yes, it could be done at a later date. You would have to, you know, redo some of the work that was already in right. place, um, and you would have to have a design for it. Right. Yeah. And I think that's what we've been warned about a few times: is that to redo some of the work that you did. No, I understand that. Yeah, I, I just don't. I'm just a little uncomfortable as as in in the position that I'm in as the city manager uh, on a certain side of the ledger authorizing something to go through where I don't know where the money is going to come come from to otherwise fund the project in that and so I'm com trying to compartmentalize this and looking at it as a different I think it's I, I personally I think it's a great idea I, I favor it but not knowing the funding source you know gives me some some angst and even voting on it quite frankly even offering my own vote on it um, and then compartmentalizing it and treating it as a different project, albeit I recognize you might have to flush some money down the drain if you find, if you find, if if we find the money or someone finds the money to do it. But when you're talking millions of dollars, um, it's it, it it's not two hundred thousand dollars. It's two hundred thousand dollars of design, and then millions of you, know, you still you spec it, and you still got to do the construction for millions of dollars without a funding source. So I'm just wondering if at this point in time whether this is somewhat of an exercise in futility. So the reason, part of the reason for getting the design done now is to get those that are interested in having synthetic field to see a design, to see the costs and have hard numbers. Okay. I don't have a lot of angst about the design, the $200,000. I'm right. angst about finding, the, recognizing that you got to find the funds. Correct. Otherwise, and it hasn't even been remotely identified. It's just, Correct. it's not how we usually proceed, at least on our side of the fence. Correct. So uh, there's on projects. So there's um, multiple. The uh, the other side of it is trying to get this done within the timeline yeah. by 2025, and right, getting right, the 52.5 right. right. percent yeah. reimbursement on right. it. And whatever happens on election day, and if regionalization, then the 80 percent would go towards this. The funding, whatever yeah. the costs are of that project. That's a good point. Can I ask for a reminder of is having the field done, regardless of the makeup of the field, is having the field done a required a requirement for the construction to be certified as complete in, in getting the yes, okay. the field is part of it. Right. Thank 2025. You. Yes. That's what I thought you meant, but yeah. So that's the hard the challenge is one, we don't have funding, I, I but have two, in order to receive funding, we needed a design to show mm -hmm. the costs. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about why this is not like a, a, a citywide conversation or why we're having it in this, in this meeting? I don't know. I might ask you the same question. <laughs> I missed the last two meetings, so I was away. So I, I, I'm just trying to. It, 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 the questions that I'm asking, because uh, I saw the, that there was going to be a presentation, it just occurred to me. I started thinking about the numbers, the, the context of the numbers, you know. So, yeah, city-wide conversation, of course. Part of the reason that we have this meeting is because we're trying to get the Um, engage um, SLAM to design this. 
Yeah, with the caveat that some of the work, some of it has to be redone. So I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. But would it be reimbursable by ride somewhere down the road? Yeah. Yes. Some, yeah. It depends. It could be 67%. If it's, yeah, if it's still where we're at, it's 35%. It could be 80%. Yeah. It could be 35, it could be 67, right. it could be 80. It's, just, it's right. all about the timing. Right. Yes. So I guess the question is do we want to vote now to, to put it forward or do we want to wait or are people ready to get the information Well, I'm concerned that if we don't have the, the numbers that you're talking about, that we're not going to be able to go for funding for this. So I'm just wondering if that's if it's short sighted not to do the two hundred thousand in order to have time in order to get grants or other funding. Right. Yeah, I and on that note, I mean if we do if we vote for this and we get the design and it's just way too much and we and we just have to face the reality that we can't do it. Uh, we will. Will we still have a design for a grass field that we can just move forward with? Okay. Thanks. Yes. I'm asking the dumb questions because I just want to make sure. I just wanted to bring up the question was is, is, is sort of the rest of the city. just raising the, 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 the practical aspect of it. I don't have a problem as a city manager looking at the design and specification, or the design aspect of the synthetic field. I've just seen, I've been down this road before with other projects. I just want everyone to realize if there's a big nut at the end of the rainbow here that you got to, and it's not within the context of, of what was authorized mm -hmm. through a bond, the bond initiative and the premiums. Um, then that there's another effort that needs to be made by many others in finding the do re me for this in a timely fashion. Correct. And what, Correct. What, what, how many, you said millions, but does that mean one millions. million, five million, ten million? I mean, what, what's the risk? If, if I recall, it's between two and a half and three million dollars. Yeah. And, and again, it's right. because we don't have a true design. Total, total. I think it was 3.5. Yeah, we don't have a full design, so it's right. it's a guesstimate right now. But at this point, we would be reimbursed half of that. If you, if you, right. <laughs> if, <laughs> Two point five, yes, kind of. If it's with, if it's with, with the, if it's with, done within the within the, the grant, window. yeah, within right. your grant. twenty twenty five. Yeah, right, right. Well, right. and within your but, funding grant. Yeah, right. I mean, if it's over the one ten or whatever, it, we won't, we don't get reimbursed on it. Yeah, 107, whatever that number was. Right, but whatever the total bond is, if it ends up being more than that, because we're already over, we don't get reimbursed on it. So when will we get the cost estimate updated? 
So, oh, I think you have to sign up. Okay. Yeah, we did yeah, so that was going to be part of my update. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Gilbane Bain staff couldn't be here tonight. Uh, they're ill. Um, so they, they have completed their estimate. Uh, Maya Coda, who is SLAM's uh, estimator, completed theirs. They're, they've reconciled it. We're now still doing one more exercise. We will be providing those numbers at the next um, uh, meeting, but we are still trending over budget, similar to what we were before. But if you don't if you don't design something and get it theoretically shovel ready, you're not going to find any. There will be no outside sources that you could seek money from on a project like this. You have to have things designed and they have to be shovel ready. I get the thrown in my face on a daily basis, the shovel ready aspect of it. That's the federal grants, the state grants, any other private grants. If you're not shovel ready, forget it. Don't even come to them. I think it's short-sighted to not do the design. I think that we should do that and then see what kind of funding comes forward and see, you know. We'll yeah, I agree. It's But as long as, you know, I think we just have to be aware and recognize that we can go forward and get the design and we might still have to say no to it. Is the, is the, um, is the estimate um, reimbursable? Yes. Oh, let me do it. Okay, so show the program. Okay. Students and It's actually more. Yeah, no, I, I think we're should, but should. It yes. Right. yes. Yeah, you would think it would. That was a good question. I, I think where the costs even out, if you were to cost it for hours of use. So if you think about, I'll just talk about 500 hours of use. Theoretically, I would certainly love to see lighting eventually included. You know, maybe that's another add-on. We just put some conduit under some sidewalks. But you could potentially go from 500 hours to you know, thousands of hours. So if you put in the value per hours of use, it, it can even out. Um, that, that's the challenge. Uh, that's a good point. Just to clarify, so so the $178,000 for design includes designing the lighting as well for the field. Could we have a brief more discussion? Very brief. Yep. You said I heard is the estimation refundable? Is what I heard the question. Yeah, right. is, is it the estimation of the design cost? Yes. That, I'm looking at the OPM. Yes. yes. Yeah. The, as part of uh, Gilbane's contract, they're doing estimates for us, which are reimbursable within their contract. Reimbursable uh, through the state. Yes. Yeah. You're going to get it as, as, as potentially a separate cost, though. It's reimbursable. Maybe not at the 52.5, but maybe at, at definitely at the 35, because we've submitted other things. Yeah. Still maybe higher. <laughs> okay, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Hi. Uh, hi. Okay, all those who are nay, please raise your right hand. Okay, one nay. And that's our report. Okay, thank you very much. We can go to the next item on the. All right, thank you. Oh, wait, and may I just before we move on, are you going to clarify? Um, are you going to clarify the budget thing? Because I know there was something about five million, but it was, I thought, a doable. Is there something not doable than what we've heard all along? So, very good point, Dr. Germain, is that although we are tracking 
five to six million over budget, there are about $5 million in escalation and contingency right now, design contingencies in that. So if you remove those um, and the potential risk for those, you are closer to where you need to be as far as your um, funding source, which is the bond and the uh, bond premium. And at the next meeting, we will present a sheet very similar to what we did last time so you can see exactly where the dollars are. Thank you. So that concludes any action items. What I'll have is at this point, I know that uh, SLAM does have a presentation. <laughs> did you have so many cookies, Mark? You ready? Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. Thank you. Go to slide sorter or, or go to presentation mode. <laughs> They'll show a little bigger. Should be. <laughs> you can just hit that one right there. Excellent. So I'm going to go through a few different uh, updates to the renderings that we've been showing. These include all the amendments based on our discussions with the Van Buren Charitable Trust. So all of those have been included to date. So this is an aerial view from Wickham Road. We, what was that? Oh, yeah, okay. Not all the trees are shown, just so we could show the building. There's a, right. There's a lot of trees right in here. This is an aerial view as if you were flying a drone higher up above the building, but you could see uh, where the red RHS is the main entry into the student commons. Over to the right is a three-story academic wing. The gym is in about center. I'm not gonna touch the screen again. <laughs> that guy right there. Uh, automotive is on the end over here and we'll show you a couple different views as we fly around. We can go to the next slide. Again, everything we're showing, everything that we've been discussing and designing to date has been based on these four guiding principles for us that were developed early on around Newport Pride, purposeful and resilient design, experiential learning, and sustainable actions. So all of these sort of govern our decisions together, working with you. Go to the next slide, please. Just a, the contents of what's gonna happen inside that container that I'm showing you. These are the types of spaces that we've been designing together. Uh, so we're very excited about where we are and that bid packages are out and we're getting numbers back uh, from contractors. The next slide, please. This is an aerial shot. Uh, you can see that we've, Wickham Road is right here. The field that we were just talking about is right there where the existing high school is. That entrance on Old Fort is the existing entrance. The tennis courts are up just off the screen. The high school proper here, that view that I showed you before was looking this direction. The West parking lot, its current shape is about the same as what it is today. To give you sort of an orientation view <coughs> this is that view that I showed you before, a little serpentine seat height wall, so if you are visiting the school or if you're waiting to catch your bus or a late bus, you can hang out there into the student commons. There's the, you can see the gymnasium here, as I mentioned before. There is a path along Wickham where there isn't a sidewalk there today. We're providing this path with steps up and a handicap accessible entrance off to the screen on the right to get onto that terrace. This view is, I've been back in the drone. I've flown the drone back over. Here's the west parking lot over here. You can start to see uh, the corner where automotive is housed. This is the fitness room, the corner of the gym. You can see a little bit of the red from the student commons entry. You can see the flagpole. The road there is where the buses will drop off and collect all the students. 
You can see the three-story building mass. It is a L-shaped three-story, which has been pretty consistent for a long period of time now. The roofs are solar ready, so they are able to structure and some conduit and pathways to make that happen over time. This is, the drone is flying back around. I'm on top of the hill right now, looking back down. This is the edge of culinary. That's one of the egress stairs where we've added more glass. Uh, the main loading dock is where that van is dropping off right now. Construction technology is just beyond that. You can see the field off in the distance right here. This is from the north parking lot. So if I'm a parent dropping off, I'm dropping my student off here, and they're going into the north side of the north of the student commons. The central office is off to the left here. Cosmetology and culinary are entered if you're a patron through these doors. Again, some more of the glass that we've added back into the project, glass into the stairs. So as you go through the building, these stairs are really daylight. So folks aren't using the elevator as part of building well, uh, with wellness in mind. The stairs are daylit, very comfortable, doors on hold opens, they're wider than needed. Uh, so it promotes active use of those stairs. There's three of those on each of the corners. This is the entry into the commons. Go to the next slide. I've come back around. This is where the bus drop off would be. More stairs, that stair, we were looking just the view the other direction. This is the side of the central offices here. The three-story academic wing. Now we're back across the field. We're on by the cell tower, effectively looking back down on the field. So you can see how everything nestles in, bias more towards Wickham Road, really creating a, a pretty elegant solution. The next. Here we're coming in from the other direction. So you can see this is a little bit of a minimal retaining wall that we have on the edge of the track. There's an opportunity for naming there as well as you approach. You can see the school off into the distance on the high point of the site. Hasn't changed. Schedule hasn't changed, so Kathy tells me. So any questions? Yes. Yeah, it's under the, that would be under the track right now. So I think there are options on site for them later on, should uh, they be invited back. I'm sorry. Yeah, what was the question? The Tree Conservancy, what happens to them, their fate. The Tree Conservancy has requested Pauline to meet with the administration of the high school. And they'd like to actually work within the building, more in classrooms with students. And they would still continue to have something on site but they're also looking for a different location because, um, you know, the um, samples, uh, what's it called, the cuttings they're doing, and then they're growing those. They're going to need more room. Mm. So they are looking for additional space and place. But they're on campus all the way through the construction project. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in modern building design, it, there's a whole initiative called WELL, which is designing around uh, the health of the occupants. So we designed egress stairs not to be dark, cavernous stairs that nobody wants to use, but they're full of daylight, can be used outside. So if I'm a student and I'm able, I can use that stair. There's certainly an elevator there for those that need it. You sprain an ankle or, or you're mobility impaired for a period of time. We want you walking up and down the stairs and staying fit. Yeah. <laughs> That'll do it, yeah. So there's an elevator for that, yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, yes, I'll just give a brief update on Rogers High School since um, Belita is not well tonight. She did send me some information. 
So ongoing work is uh, they're stockpiling loom for the temporary parking lot and the bus loop. Uh, they're grading that area. Abatement clearance and testing at by Fuss and O'Neill in the auditorium. And upcoming work is the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, asbestos abatement uh, breakdown and ear tests are going to be happening in the next couple of days. A shutdown of power to cut and cap and make safe the auditorium is happening on Saturday, uh, October 22nd. And that's been coordinated with the school. Um, and then the start of the demolition will probably be happening shortly thereafter that following week. Uh, form and prep concrete walkways are going to start uh, as well at the east entrance and some of the temporary parking lot in the next couple of weeks. And as far as procurement status at next week's meeting, there'll be a recommendation to award for site enabling and foundation excavation and some utilities. Um, and then out to bid right now, structural st steel, the bids are due on 1026, the elevator are due back on 1026 and an additional supplement for those bids was issued on October 14th. And that's the, uh, the update from the Gilbane side. So just as a follow up, uh, a new marking was put up by the tree conservancy. Um, I don't understand what it is. So maybe tomorrow can find out because it's very close to the conservancy. And it's supposed to stay in place. I just don't know what the marking's all about. And I didn't know. Yes. Yes. That's... Yeah. Oh, okay. Sometimes it's an offset. So if there's if there's some construction happening 10, 20, 30, or 100 feet away, and they don't want the marking to be disturbed, they'll put a 100-foot marking so that someone can measure off it. And it could be just a survey mark or something, but we'll look into that tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. On site. It made people a little nervous. Yeah. Today. It doesn't necessarily mean it's disturbance it could just be again just a marking so somebody can measure off of or take a point off of okay and i appreciate gilbane baby monitoring that <laughs> water pipe coming yes. in they've got fluorescent paint all over it okay thank you that concludes our agenda for tonight madam chair thank you very much and, uh, so moved second Thank you, everyone. They're cookies. What did you say? Oh, I thought you said I put some or something. I was like, I was like, why do you?